I'm going to talk about um, some of the questions, the broad questions about what is cancer, um, you know, uh, how does it arise, um, you know, perhaps why it uh, is developing and some of our options for treatment. So um, these are some uh, stats from the Canadian Cancer Society that outline the cancer problem and the scope of the problem. And, um, and, and it's a big problem. It's the number one cause of uh, death in Canada. Uh, two in five uh, develop cancer in their lifetime. And, um, one in four Canadians are uh, likely to die of cancer. And, and so this is a massive problem that um, obviously groups like the uh, Cancer uh, Research Institute and, um, and cancer researchers across the country have been working very hard to, to try to improve. And, and the good news is uh, things are uh, definitely improving for some cancers, but uh, not for all cancers. And so there's uh, still more uh, work to do. So, um, <clears throat> Uh, one thing that uh, we do know is that uh, cancer uh, risk uh, rises as we age. Uh, there's uh, definitely uh, an element to uh, cancer biology that involves uh, loss of some of the protections uh, that we have um, as, as our body ages. And um, you can see with the incidence uh, peaking into our uh, twilight years. And uh, what is uh, increasingly clear um, in, in cancer is that uh, we, we do have differences that develop between uh, males and females. And uh, we need to account for that um, as we uh, develop our, uh, our research projects. So I, I wanted to just kind of uh, do a, a fairly uh, basic introduction to uh, what is cancer. Uh, cancer is certainly uh, developing as a result of mutations, and um, and, and what this uh, schematic is attempting to show here is really that um, damage to our uh, DNA and our genome is is happening all the time. Every time our cells divide, there is uh, that um, element of risk where uh, damaged DNA needs to be repaired um, in order for that. Uh, damage to not be passed on uh, to uh, daughter cells that have um, a different phenotype uh, than they should. And so uh, we're uh, fortunate that in most cases, um, DNA damage can be sensed and uh, triggers uh, different forms of uh, cell death. And uh, so we have these um, important checkpoints in our, in our cells that can prevent this damage uh, leading to cancer. Uh, one of the most famous um, um, protein that plays a role in this is a protein called P53. And um, this is often called the guardian of the genome because it can uh, sense uh, DNA damage and um, elicit a response that prevents that cell from uh, passing on its genetic material uh, until the uh, damage can be repaired. Unfortunately, um, cancers evolve mutations that disrupt this important uh, tumor suppressor, P53. And, uh, so that's kind of part of this initial mechanism to allow uh, DNA damage to go unchecked. And it can result in this uh, stage of genome instability in cancer that um, often arises um, as the uh, primary tumor is developing. And then as, as we start talking a little bit deeper about you know, what is cancer, what is, what is a, a tumor uh, and a tumor microenvironment today. Um, one of the important uh, early steps that the uh, primary tumor develops is a blood supply because it needs a supply of nutrients, right, uh, to, to continue growing. And so you get this kind of rewiring of blood vessels in and around the tumor. And uh, of course, this has become part of the arsenal of uh, cancer drugs to try to target this signaling that's happening that's causing blood vessels. So I uh, wanted to give you a couple examples where we know quite a lot of these kind of mutations that arise in some of these key uh, tumor suppressor genes. One example shown here is in colon cancer, where you have um, about a 10-year progression window 
from uh, um, incidents where you, you get kind of an early benign uh, polyps developing. And um, this is often due to loss of the tumor suppressor gene called APC. And then uh, there's uh, a need to acquire additional mutations to develop um, full-blown uh, colon cancer. So from polyps to early adenomas, late adenomas, and full-blown carcinoma, it's a series of acquired mutations that um, need to uh, interrupt some of these key uh, checkpoints that uh, prevent these um, from becoming um, malignant. And so um, part of the reason I, I put screening here at the, the top of the slide is that um, you know, we, we do have uh, screening programs for cancers like colorectal cancer. And um, it's important to, to try to uh, catch some of these lesions early because uh, again, um, it's very localized and it's much easier for, um, for treatments for localized disease before it becomes invasive and um, traumatic. Um, and so just uh, an overview then of the types of uh, therapies available for cancer. Um, when the cancer is localized, uh, obviously uh, surgery uh, is uh, the, the usual course to remove as much of the cancer as the uh, surgeon can identify. And then uh, usually followed by a course of radiation therapy. In this case, it's trying to uh, uh, kill any of the residual cancer cells that, uh, of course, can't be visualized. They're microscopic. And so the idea is to take the uh, cancer tumor bed and to apply radiation that can cause the uh, cell death of the uh, dividing cancer cells. And then uh, we have a whole host of systemic um, forms of therapy that are really in place to try to uh, prevent the establishment of secondary tumors outside of the original tumor bed. And uh, this often requires a course of chemotherapy. And again, these are agents that are uh, killing rapidly dividing cells. And uh, this is why many of those uh, chemotherapy also cause uh, patients to lose their hair, um, killing the, the uh, rapidly dividing cells in the hair follicles. So um, other forms of, of therapy that uh, have been developed include hormone therapies in some cases where there's a, a particular dependence of that cancer on a very specific pathway and uh, some of the very elegant uh, work in, in some of these hormone therapies and uh, making them uh, work well um, for, for patient care have been led in trials right here at uh, the uh, ECTG group in the Queen's Cancer Research Institute. And um, lastly, the, the types of therapy that I want to focus on um, are uh, some emerging areas uh, where we have kind of uh, some newer directions with targeted therapy uh, that I will talk about and uh, immunotherapy that uh, Dr. Koshi will expand on. So, um, there's an interesting Gardner Foundation connection to this um, uh, next part. Uh, and this involves the uh, 2021 International Gardner Award uh, to Dr. Mary Claire King. Um, so Mary Claire King is a geneticist and she was following um, families that had a high incidence of breast and ovarian cancer in, in, um, in their female um, members of the family tree. And she was intrigued by this. Uh, she had worked on genetic projects that weren't cancer, uh, but uh, thought that there was very likely a cause, a genetic cause of this high cancer incidence in family trees. And she was determined to apply some of her genetic skills in, in tracing which genes were being passed on with this risk um, to this important question. So uh, her research team was actually first to uh, map a breast cancer susceptibility gene that they called BRCA1. And so uh, they were able to, once they mapped to the gene, they were able to clone it and uh, really led to a huge uh, expansion of research in this area, uh, leading to very um, important impacts 
that were recognized as part of her award as being able to then um, allow for diagnosis genetic testing to see whether or not families carry this particular um, BRCA uh, set of mutations. And this can lead to different ways to uh, monitor um, people in these families and to uh, try to either avoid cancer um, with prophylactic surgeries or uh, at least try to uh, monitor closely enough that um, any cancers that uh, arise can be treated uh, very early. So in this context, um, we have a way to turn a discovery on the genetics of breast cancer and ovarian cancer into a form of targeted therapy. And this um, involves a uh, class of inhibitors that you, some of you might've heard of um, called the PARP inhibitors. So uh, PARP inhibitors, um, they uh, can prevent uh, some of the um, normal uh, DNA repair that happens when a single strand of our uh, DNA in the genome is nicked. Um, with a PARP inhibitor, you can get um, emergence of these double strand breaks. And so in normal cells where you have expression of the BRCA proteins, uh, they can facilitate uh, a very efficient DNA repair process. So normal tissue and normal cells are not harmed by the PARP inhibitor uh, treatments. However, what makes this a, a kind of form of targeted therapy is that in cancers where there's a known BRCA1 or 2 mutation, if you treat with PARP inhibitors um, and cause those type of double strand breaks by kind of poisoning the, the DNA repair process, um, there's no BRCA function left in, uh, present in those cancer cells, and this can uh, trigger uh, cancer cell death. And so, uh, again, this is an exciting direction where we can understand more personally the genetic basis of the cancer and pair it with a drug that's kind of fine-tuned to uh, impact the uh, deficiencies of the cancer without affecting normal tissue and normal cells. So, um, so this is a, a very exciting direction and uh, certainly um, many, many different forms of targeted therapy are, are being developed. So then um, last couple of slides for me and then I'll, I'll turn the baton uh, over to Dr. Koti. Um, and uh, this is just kind of broadening out the uh, way that we think about cancer into a little bit more of a holistic view of cancer with um, contributions of both changes in the seed, which we can kind of think of as those primitive early cancer cells with some differences and mutations, as well as the soil. So the concept that you can't grow a plant, of course, with just the seed, you need nourishment from the soil. Uh, the, the same thing turns out to be true for cancer. And um, even in the late 1800s, um, research by uh, Dr. Paget um, showed that there were very specific uh, places that uh, breast cancers would spread. And uh, he, he uh, determined that through doing autopsies and uh, basically put out this theory that, um, you know, it's not just random distribution of cancer. They need some type of a soil, some type of a nourishing place that would allow for these metastases to grow. And so uh, this has uh, certainly uh, been the basis for a lot of research in the last decade or more. And, um, and, and what you'll see in the next slide is um, uh, kind of digging deeper into what, what actually makes up the, uh, the so-called uh, tumor microenvironment and the concept that we, what we kind of pictured in the initial slide with one round ball of cells all of those cells being cancer is uh, very far from the truth. And um, what we know is that the uh, tumor microenvironment has a number of normal cells. In, um, in, in some cases, those normal cells get co-opted into providing factors that promote the uh, growth of the tumor and the suppression of the immune system. And so uh, what we're learning as we dig deeper into all of these different populations of cells that uh, develop 
in a growing tumor is that some of these uh, some of these cell types are other targets that we can consider, and um, some of which are um, involved in immunotherapy for cancer, and uh, have, have really revolutionized some treatments for cancers that were otherwise um, essentially untreatable. And uh, so we're um, very excited to uh, try to understand what aspects of the tumor microenvironment uh, will offer up kind of the next generation of therapies and the idea that, that you really need to treat this as, um, as a whole when we're trying to design uh, cancer uh, therapy. So um, I will stop there and uh, welcome uh, Dr. Koti to uh, go a little bit deeper into how the immune system plays a role in cancer. Morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Dr. Gwali and uh, Dr. Craig for uh, involving me in this event. And I'm delighted to see such a good participation for one of its kind event that we are holding here at the Queen's Cancer Research Institute. I'm delighted and I'm privileged to be part of this e uh, particular event. So um, as Dr. Craig alluded to, um, the, the immune system is really, really important and probably one of the strongest weapons that we carry within our cells that can fight cancer. So recent advances, as Dr. Craig mentioned, have focused a lot on uh, equipping our own immune system, reinvigorating our immune system to fight cancer. And that adds on to the layers of chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and surgery, all those kind of treatments that have been proven really successful over the last several decades. So immunotherapy has basically become one of the strongest pillars of uh, cancer treatments. So I'm just going to focus on the key events that we have found in terms of how uh, immune system fights cancers and what are those specific events that have been kind of exploited uh, recently to, to develop newer treatments uh, to, to reinvigorate our immune system. So um, as Dr. Craig mentioned, cancer journey is pretty long. It takes seven to 10 years or even more, nobody knows, but on an average, let's say 10 years. And in that, over those 10 years, the cells, sorry, this pointer is not working. So as you're seeing, this is basically showing what the cancer cells acquire within themselves as uh, genetic alterations. So accompanying those genetic alterations, we all have our immune system that tries to fight and curb those kind of um, altered events so that we don't develop uh, cancer. So that's why we don't see cancer until later in, the, uh, later in our lives. And basically, our immune system is trained in a way to avoid self-destruction. So those kind of events, cancer cells are basically trying to escape, which is why uh, cancer basically progresses. So what is our immune system consisting of? It has a whole bunch of immune cells, different types of immune cells that come in different varieties, different shapes and sizes, all having their specialized functions that undergo training and training in a way to, um, to get equipped with a feature that tells them not to kill ourselves and only to kill pathogens, infections, or something that is abnormal. Um, th that is being detected as a danger to our cells, which is one of them being, uh, being cancer. Um, a feature that it is equipped with is memory, as we know from the vaccinations that we all are undergoing through multiple times. Some of the, that memory is short term and some of them is, that is long term. So clearly immune uh, response to cancer is not a very long memory because cancer cells are very clever in terms of acquiring mutations and trying to come up with ways to evade or, or um, uh, fight off the, the immune response. Um, so the main branches of immune response are innate and adaptive immune responses that we all have. Innate being quickly, quick responses that come in as, um, as a very, very early immune responses and adaptive being the long-term which come later, which are many times informed by our innate responses and which are longer lasting. And both of them have been kind of exploited um, in terms of treatment or in terms of learning about the cancer journey. 
and how the disease progresses using various models in the lab or, or um, in, in, even from patient samples. So uh, the theory of tumor immune surveillance, basically how the immune system patrols and uh, kind of restricts tumor growth, often it fails when we detect cancer and often it succeeds when we have a, a successful evasion of cancer. So the way it starts is over these 10 years or so is the initial sensing by locally, um, uh, locally present cells, which are resident cells. And these cells can be, the major immune cell type is the T cell, which can directly kill the cancer cells, or it can take help from other cells that kind of provide that signal to T cells and tell that it's a cancer cell and it's time for you to kill, uh, eat it and kill it. So um, uh, in that process, what happens is one of them is a winner and one of them is a loser. And uh, what we are seeing here is as the disease progresses, you're seeing that the, the, there, is a, there is an immune suppression developing when the cancer cells are winning, when they're trying to um, uh, progress and establish their own community. What you're seeing is the immune cells that are also coming in and trying to fight off, but they have nowhere to go. So you're seeing those cells are present there. When you resect a tumor, uh, when the surgeon resects the tumor, you're seeing that uh, uh, community, the entire community of immune cells and the cancer cells that are present there. And often that informs us that the immune system has failed, which is why uh, the patient is experiencing the symptoms and, and uh, the disease. So in the lab um, or, or when the pathologist examines this tumor after it is being resected by, uh, by the surgeon, and here you're seeing examples of ovarian, bladder, or prostate cancer. So after the tumor is resected and the pathologist has confirmed the stage, the grade, and how bad the disease is, it can be taken to the lab uh, and, and it can be examined for and, and kind of you can um, uh, make a decision on whether the immune system, what, what the state of the immune system is, how well the cancer has been uh, fought off by the immune system. And the way you, you can do it is by that tumor can be printed on glass slide and you can do that for multiple numbers of cases at one uh, on one slide to make it easy and try to identify those events um, uh, that are snapshot events, uh, obviously, and um, those events that, that can inform you about how the disease journey is going to be or how the patient is uh, going to respond to a certain kind of treatment. Now, this process is not very easy, and we know that it's not as black and white, but still, there are some uh, hallmark events that we are able to identify and kind of guess how the patient uh, may respond to certain kind of treatment. So what uh, we do in the lab or what a pathologist can do, does in the lab is basically stains or colors or paints those, those tumors with different colors uh, or different markers. Those markers are specific to those immune cells um, if, that have infiltrated when the cancer is, is evolving and trying to fight off and may have failed. So those um, events basically look like these. And this is just one technology that we have applied in the lab. And what you're seeing here is in green are the cancer cells and in pink and blue are the immune cells. So this picture basically kind of is an example that tells you how, uh, how hard the immune cells have tried to fight off the cancer and still have failed or exhausted or tired. And you can see all different kinds of pictures such as from top to bottom, you're seeing a green to pink, meaning a colder environment where the cancer cells have kind of not let the immune cells to infiltrate, and a hotter environment when you have seen the cancer cells, uh, the immune cells have tried to come in, tried to fight, but have not succeeded. So we encounter all these kind of states, and on that basis, we can kind of divide the tumor into different states as cold or hot or an a spectrum. And that spectrum somewhat has been informative in telling us whether the patient is going to respond to a certain kind of treatment, even to conventional chemotherapy or radiation, or, or even to newer, newer uh, immunotherapies. So this is another example of a study that was conducted here at the Cancer Research Institute. Um, and these patients, over 300 patients, bladder cancer patients, tumors of which we, over the five, last or five, six years, we had collected here uh, with the help of pathologists, 
And uh, we basically constructed um, a, a, a basically a tumor microarray that I was showing, tissue microarray was constructed where almost 300 patient tumors were placed on a single glass slide and stained with different color, uh, colors that identified different immune cell populations. So um, a few of those immune cell populations turned out to be really informative. And what you're seeing here in blue, the blue circles are B cells, which are antibody producing cells, which are mainly the, the key army that comes to help with responding to COVID vaccines or other viral infections. And another cell type, which is called uh, a macrophage, which are present throughout our so immune system basically posts it, these are incident commands at different places in our body. And the cancer that occurs uh, or affects different system of the systems of the body have different types or different kinds of immune system uh, responses um, uh, that differ across different sites. So what we found here was increased number or more of these two cell types that were present in these tumors uh, these particular patients had exhibited early recurrence or did not respond to the most commonly used immunotherapy in uh, bladder cancer, that is BCG immunotherapy. So that's one example, uh, but it's not as black and white as we know, it's, it's very heterogeneous. Over time, we are collecting these snapshots of events, but over time, it's a dynamic event, so it can, it can be quite variable. And this heterogeneity can exist at multiple levels. It can uh, exist at the tumor level. It can exist between different patients or in the, within the patients itself from the metastatic sites or the primary sites. So uh, basically this has, this still remains a challenge and why we are not able to find clear good biomarkers of immune response to cancer and use that as an information. But it's not uh, all that bad. We have had several successes and several events have been really informative in telling how the patient can respond. Now, um, as Dr. Craig mentioned about some of the checkpoints that cancer cells have, there are some checkpoints that immune system also has, immune cells also have, because that's how we, we control our immune responses. Otherwise, we would not exist if the immune response, there will be tissue destruction. So um, some of those proteins, there's a whole bunch of proteins, there are hundreds of proteins, but the most uh, successful ones that have been recently developed into uh, or come into clinic have been the ones that target uh, the protein called PD-1 and PDL one immune checkpoints. So these checkpoints can be expressed on immune cells or the cancer cells. And cancer cells are very clever. They learn from uh, the community. It's like they mimic the, the pathogen or antigen. And they come up with these kind of evasion mechanisms to stop the immune cells from, um, uh, from, uh, from killing them. So these events have been successfully targeted in some cancers, and some cancers have benefits, seen some benefits, uh, not all. These are really expensive drugs, and Dr. Givali can speak more about those. But um, there have been a lot of success stories in uh, bladder and, and lung cancer, and, and, and more and more clinicians are trying to make combinations of these drugs and try to improve, try to establish the right sequence at which these drugs need to be administered. So what you're seeing in boxes is, is that interaction that can be blocked and uh, kind of release the brakes on the immune system and how we can kind of expand or, or reinvigorate or re-stimulate the patient's uh, immune response. Now, um, coming to biomarkers, who, can, who responds better? As you're seeing here on the right side of this, uh, this graph, those are the, the, the patient, the, the tumors that mainly are um, uh, on, on your um, surfaces that are more exposed to the environment, such as lung, such as bladder, such as melanoma. These are the, the tumors that have shown some benefits, some positive responses to, the, to these newer immune checkpoint blockade. And the reason for these is the number of mutations that these kind of tumors have. But this is, again, not as, in, as black and white, but there's a lot of uh, interesting uh, information coming out on how and why these tumors are uh, responding more, right? And this is also because, let's say, the example of bladder cancer, there's chronic smoking or lung cancer, there's smoking, so there's more mutations that are coming along as the cancer is trying to progress. And more mutations also means that the immune system is trying to uh, recognize those mutations and you see more of those immune cells around and you see more of those checkpoints there. So they are easily uh, targetable and responding to these immune checkpoint treatments. 
Another very exciting uh, treatment that has evolved is called the CAR T-cell therapy, the chimeric antigen receptor T-cell therapy, which basically has been very successful in liquid tumors and, and, um, um, and, and we and Queen's also is, is boasts about uh, one of the recent grants that has been uh, given to Queen's University to, to make this treatment available in a more cost-effective manner to, manner to Canadian patients. So in this treatment, what is done is as T cells are the major immune cells, uh, as we know, in addition to other cells as well, that fight cancer. In this particular tre uh, treatment strategy, what is done is T cells are taken from the patients. They are re-engineered, they're re-equipped with their killing capacity and infused back into the patients. And that way you can increase the patient's response or, 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 or limit cancer recurrence. So that has been successful in a lot of uh, liquid cancers and a lot of uh, uh, newer research is ongoing to make these um, uh, available for solid tumors as well. Um, this figure is very complex, but what I'm trying to show here is the number of immune stimulating agents that are currently under trials. In the outermost circle, you're seeing all the treatments that are being developed to re-stimulate your immune response or release the breaks that have been put by the cancer cells on the immune response. In the center is uh, different colors that are reflecting your immune system as, and, and the tumor as being a cold, less infiltrated, um, and, and a heart, which is red, which is more infiltrated. So that information that you obtain at the time of resection and staining with different colors for different antibodies for different uh, cancer cell, uh, immune cells, you can use that information to, to classify patient groups into, uh, for treatment with um, these newer um, uh, uh, drugs. Now, a very important concept uh, that we should not forget is um, most of the cancer cases are in uh, individuals that are over 70 years old. And as we know with us, with our aging immune system also ages. So there's a lot of exhaustion associated with it, which is why um, cancer Im immune checkpoint blockade therapy, the success is kind of more in individuals that are older. As we know, lung cancer, bladder cancer, these are uh, mostly in individuals who are 65, 70 years old, where our immunosenescence or immunologic decline has also initiated. So something that we need to remember uh, when, we, when we think about immunotherapy, the response to immunotherapy, there's only so much we can stimulate the immune system because our body is not making that much of immune cells that it used to when it was younger. So, uh, which is why we need to come up with combination treatments that can make this response even longer or sustain longer. Um, I would like to end uh, my, uh, my talk with this particular slide, and this is uh, about the increasing um, incidence of cancer or estimated increase uh, in, in cancer across the globe. We know that the uh, global population has increased to 8 billion, and we are going to see an increase in cancer incidence um, because of the aging populations. Yes, there have been successful treatments. The mortality has reduced, but the incidence is predicted to increase, so we probably need to equip ourselves better uh, by holding events like this, educational changing lifestyle factors that may help um, uh, improve response um, uh, to, to newer cancer treatments. Thank you.